All right, welcome to my uh, presentation on Connect, Why Are You So Slow? Uh, my name is Frederick Lawler. I work at, I, I work at Cloudflare as a systems engineer. Um, I am most known for my kernel work on the uh, security hook for the create user namespace. Um, a traffic control, uh, well, I didn't cause the CVE, but I certainly fixed it for the traffic control, uh, no queue. And I'm also known for the PCI print K macros uh, littered about in the PCI subsystem. So before we really get dive into this talk, uh, we really want to talk about some of the uh, unique or one of the unique uh, cases that we have at Cloudflare uh, in terms of uncached resources and uh, why we make so many connections out to perhaps a single origin. Um, so uh, we're going to start there and then we're going to dive into a little bit about the connect algorithm, um, specifically INET hash connect. And then we're going to follow up with uh, some solutions that we kind of came up with uh, uh, to solve this problem for our case. So for un uncached resources, uh, we typically have this flow. Um, it's very simplistic. Um, we don't really have uh, a concept of an end user considering that it's pretty relative to where caches are, or where assets are served from. So we tend to call our end end users um, eyeballs because you know people have eyeballs and they're looking up an asset. Um, so the request typically goes into our Cloudflare network. Um, it eventually arrives at some colo location and on a and on a machine that runs this uh, uh, frontline service um, that we just uh, initialize with FL. Um, FL then picks another metal within the same colo to actually uh, to uh, to pick a cache service um, that will actually send the request out to the origin to fetch the asset to bring it all the way back to the eyeball. Um, and this is our typical workflow for uncached assets. So this talk is going to be primarily about how do we um, optimize uh, this problem for us here at Cloudflare. Um, so the way this works is that our metals um, or servers, however you want to call them, are typically set with a port range of about 56,000 uh, 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 inferior ports. And uh, the way we uh, leverage these ports to establish many connections is we have this uh, uh, basic uh, socket uh, for TCP. Uh, we set the bind IP uh, address no port socket option. And then uh, obviously we bind the uh, source IP that we want to connect with and then obviously make the connection afterwards. So uh, the reason why we do this um, is because uh, uh, we want to enable us to pick IP addresses in which we would serve uh, or fetch these assets from. And uh, this can be useful for a variety of reasons. Say uh, trust reasons is just one trivial example. Um, uh, it, it's, it's always nice to know that our customers know that requests are coming from us, right? So we can be in their allow list, things like that. Um, and we have um, a link here that kind of goes more in depth into uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the reasons why we eventually picked it. But the most important thing to take away from uh, this pattern is uh, we're late binding a port as we do a connect. So we're not binding a port immediately. We're waiting until we actually make our actual connection to uh, bind that port. So we get something like this. I know it's a little hard to see, um, but we actually saw a spike uh, in May of about 50,000 uh, requests out to a single origin. So uh, this particular uh, customer um, had a really unlucky day with us, um, but, um, not all, uh, but not all for loss, right? Um, we typically have two IP addresses uh, that we assign to our CAS service to, to perform this, uh, uh, these, these sort of connections. And that 50,000 connections are actually split between these two. So we kind of do like a little low balancing um, trick with that. So it's not all bad. So in reality, we're about sending, in total to the single destination, we're sending the 56,000 or 50,000 connections. But in reality, uh, we're, uh, on our end, it's split to maybe 28,000, right? <clears throat> so when we took a func like, so when we uh, took a function latency of a synthetic workload to kind of uh, to kind of profile uh, how this might look, um, we can see that we have um, a little bit of a bimodal distribution. Um, we have the fast path um, on the, well, the, the y-axis is the time in milliseconds, or nanoseconds, sorry, uh, that it takes to establish a connection, um, but not like establish, establish. We're not talking about back and forth. We're just talking about this uh, strict uh, connect syscall um, in, the, in this case. Um, and uh, on the x-axis, we have the amount of connections that we're making. So in this, uh, in this example, we've modified uh, work um, which is an, a nice little tool to uh, stress test your uh, applications. And we um, set that to try to keep around 70,000 connections active at, at, uh, at any given point because they, they come up, they come down, 
just fill them in as much as possible, and we get this bimodal distribution. But we actually want to use one IP address. So when we actually load balance between the two, we saw that uh, with two IP addresses, it's somewhat OK. Um, but with one, uh, and well, I'm jumping ahead. But the reason why we want one IP address is because uh, IP addresses are getting prohibitively expensive, right? Um, this is, uh, uh, I realize this is an old chart. Um, we just wanted to show the, uh, you know, over time, the, the cost of IP addresses over uh, 2022. Um, and I've checked for the last year, and it's around roughly uh, $30 in IP. Um, so on the uh, y-axis, we have the amount of money, and on the x, the, the time. And so when we actually look at one IP address, our bimodal distribution becomes even more pronounced. So we see that uh, about half of the connections are in the fast case, and the other half are in the, are in the slow case. And for fun, we tried with three IP addresses. And this is the really interesting part, is that the more IP addresses we have, the faster this becomes. And this is due to the load balancing, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So this is fine for most workloads, but for uh, Cloudflare, um, our customers are still largely IPv4. Um, and we want to achieve similar performance with one IPv4 address as we see with three IPs. Uh, and we want to uh, leverage our infrastructure to lazily hand off these connections um, in the, uh, in, well, I guess in the slow case, right? We want to fail fast. We want to be able to say, we have no more ports available, we cannot make any more connections, send it off to the next metal. So it's time to investigate a little bit about why that is. We took a flame graph of a typical uh, production uh, server. Um, this is not representative of any of the data in this, uh, in this slide or in this presentation going forward, but this is a typical uh, representation here. Um, so we wanted to kind of see like what are our, what are our culprits that might provide this uh, an explanation for our bimodal distribution. Um, so um, we can, it's, it, might, it might be a little bit hard to see, but we can see that the most amount of time is spent in the uh, high, uh, inet hash connect function. And then uh, that's further broken down into the um, uh, inet check established. And then we have uh, some lock intention. And this is uh, pretty typical for, uh, 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 pretty typical for our metals. So going, diving in a little bit deeper into the inet hash connect. Um, so it's important to remember that this function is called for both the IPv4.6 and the IPv6 case. Um, and we assume that the kernel always has to pick a port. So going forward, we have to make that assumption. And the way it works is that the inet hash connect function will make a call into secure um, IPv4, uh, IPv4 port uh, uh, ephemeral to get a hash, passes that back up into the hash connect, and then that passes it down to the underscore underscore inet hash connect function. And then in between there, we start looping over the uh, over the ports, and uh, we we call the inet check established when we when we find a port and we try to bind to it. So this is kind of what it looks like in code form. Um, I greatly reduced this down um, because there is a lot more there that is not currently uh, shown. Um, but for simplicity's sake, this is basically the the crux of the algorithm. We'll take a look at it one by one. So. First off, we, uh, we try to grab an, an offset, and this offset is provided by that, ran, uh, that, uh, that, that function that generates this hash. Now, we, I, didn't, I, I removed the slides for this um, because I, I, for, for sake of time, I figured it'd be better if we just skip going into proving why uh, the randomization is good. Trust me, it's good. Um, so what we do is we first get a, a, a random offset, and then we uh, add that to the low port of our um, of our uh, 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 IP local port range, so the very the very first port. In this case, it's uh, 9024 for us, so it's the random offset plus that, and then we have our first port to, to look at. Now, before I get dive into the loop, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, this loop right here and why this may or may not be an issue for us. Um, so, in the INET check established, um, so. In our in our in our test cases, uh, we are looking at a very not chatty uh, system, so we don't really have many ports already bound by this point um, in our, in our in our testing. So we can kind of rule this out as as a problem. Um, I know in the flame graph we can see that the uh, th that this actually produced a bigger problem, but this only re really becomes a problem when we uh, have too many connections uh, going in anyway. So like if you have uh, multiple. Uh, destinations, um, things like that, it's all unique. Um, this starts to fill up pretty quickly. So then it does become a problem later on. But for the sake of this uh, presentation, we're mainly focused on 
uh, very uh, very uh, minimum system um, to test all this stuff. And if, and if you're curious about um, uh, and, want, and want to learn more about uh, the, uh, how ports are picked and how the bind buckets work and all that fun stuff, uh, we have a link right here to uh, quantum state of the TCP port. Now it's time for the loop. <clears throat> so the way it works is first we loop over half of our uh, ephemeral port range, and then we loop over the half one for each and every single connection. And the way this works, and or I should say looks, is in this case right here, we have um, a system with, um, let's see, uh, eight sockets. And uh, it's pretty, uh, it, it can be a little confusing um, at first, but essentially we have our offset and then we add that to our low port. And in the socket case uh, zero, we're at port zero. So we're gonna go ahead and pick it, right? The next socket, again, we have another randomization and then we uh, pick, hap just happen to pick port four. But where it starts to get interesting is on the second or on the third socket, uh, we start off at the same offset as the socket before it, but because that port's already taken, then it goes to the next one. And we do that a few more times. And eventually when you're in the latter half of the port range, we get into a case here at the bottom where now we're looping over all the even ports first, and then we're adding to the offset to get the next odd one. And then now we're looping over all those to pick, to, to pick a port. So there's a lot of looping involved. So is the loop a problem? So we've kind of verified this through uh, mostly experimentation. Um, going forward, um, all the charts that we'll be looking at uh, kind of look like this. All the green dots are even ports. All the uh, red dots are uh, odd ports. And the reason is because of this uh, low port plus offset. So if the low port is even, it's always, uh, we're always going to start at the even range and then go to odd, but if it was an odd, you'd always start at the odd range and then go to even. So this, is kind of, this can kind of go back and forth. And what we see is when we open up 56,000 connections, which is the total range of our, of our system, um, that can take uh, an upwards of uh, three, uh, three minutes uh, for us to do with an overall average of 279 connections uh, per second, which is uh, not great. We expect our systems to be able to do a lot more than that. So in our conclusion, um, we kind of figured that the that the main problem with, uh, with the, the main explanation for this bimodal distribution um, must be the uh, looping. And this is evidenced by an earlier patch uh, that was submitted. Um, this person tried to make an attempt to uh, keep track of when uh, ports start parity switching over into the other port range, and then just immediately start doing that uh, once all the even ports are taken up. Unfortunately, unfortunately it was uh, not merged. And I've included a little slide here to kind of uh, give you guys uh, some example to toy around with in your own, uh, if your own machines. If you're experiencing slow connection times, you can use this little BPF script. I mean, it is networking a BPF uh, track. Um, we're making the assumption here that we're always start that your port range also starts uh, even. Um, so we're only tracking the when we do the actual port parity. Um, a trivial uh, rate can kind of tell you uh, which which uh, which task and in, in which C group. Um, um, you know, kind of uh, reach this point and, uh, you know, just keep track of that. And I've also included a link to our um, Prometheus eBPF exporter uh, to keep track of that information in Prometheus. So what do we do? So we're going to start off with some uh, feasible but not viable solutions for us. Um, we can try to split the uh, egress unicast connections over multiple IP addresses. Again, we're already doing this with at least two, um, but we want to move down to one, right? Um, we can introduce a system uh, system CTL uh, to manipulate the connect, uh, which was already attempted. It's still viable, you can do it yourself. Um, or we can pick a random port in user space and then just bind with that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we can leverage this new IP uh, local port range uh, socket option, which allows us to define uh, a local port range uh, per each uh, connection that we'd like to, um, to make. So splitting uh, egress unicast connections over two or more IP addresses. So. So some of the problems that we have identified with this approach is that we don't necessarily want to leak our networking configuration to user space. Um, it would be nice if the uh, kernel could have some sort of ability where we can uh, define um, IP addresses that we can load balance on interfaces. Um, this would be a nice uh, feature so we don't have to uh, leak this information, for instance. Um, it does require the IP uh, bind address no port socket option, bind before connect pattern. Um, and we do this strategy now, but we still want one IP address. You can introduce the uh, system CTL uh, to manipulate this. Now, this does require kernel modification. Again, the patch was submitted. And the main reason why this patch was submitted was because um, it doesn't cover 
the vast majority of use cases, right? So the way it worked was you try to um, have some volatile variable uh, defined somewhere in this uh, inet hash connect .c file or something like that. I forget, forget the exact uh, file name, but you have this uh, volatile variable there and you just keep track of when, uh, of when this occurs. But the way the loop works, and uh, we can take a uh, look at the code later um, in, in the hallway or something, but uh, it, uh, the, it, because of the random nature of picking a port, um, it doesn't always start at your starting port range. It, it's a random number in between there. So you loop through uh, all of those and then it kind of wraps around, loops through the rest of the even. Then we parity switch, same again for the odd and keep going in a circle uh, such as that. So it could have the potential to miss uh, certain cases. We can also pick a random port in user space and perform the bind before connect again. Um, so this one's a little interesting. Uh, so with, with this approach, uh, we don't have any uh, direct metrics on it, um, but the, the idea is, is you reach a conflict with picking a random port, um, and then you just try it again. And you just do that over and over and over again. Now we find, now we find that this can uh, in, uh, in, introduce um, more syscall overhead, because you keep having to make these connections. Um, and it's good to about 70 to 80% of the port range uh, utilization. But the problem is, is if you're already reaching this point, maybe consider something else. Um, but it is a viable, I mean, it is a feasible option, but it also doesn't uh, quite work for us either. Now, the interesting thing is with the uh, local port range uh, socket option is that uh, because we're now in control of the window ourselves per, per socket, uh, this can introduce an interesting uh, side effect in user space. And we can see here that even though we have a 5,000K uh, 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 port window, um, we're making a trade-off saying that, you know, maybe we're not reaching our full 56,000, but, uh, you know, in this case, we're okay with, five, with 5K windows. We can exhaust that within about 1.5 seconds. The loop problems still persist, and it's, and it's evidenced by this uh, bimodal here as well. But we found that if you kind of reduce this down to a 1K uh, window size, um, we can reduce that to 2.2 milliseconds. And we can see here that the bimodal distribution is almost non-existent. So you would figure with smaller n, you would be able to uh, uh, go through your connections a lot faster. Now, another interesting idea with this approach is you can also leverage overlapping. So if you, uh, and, we'll, and we'll go into this a little bit, but um, the, the idea is uh, you can define different windows and you can kind of overlap them and you just make the assumption that you're not gonna exhaust all the ports within that um, all the time. So this is what we ended up doing. We added a random offset to our window. So we went from three minutes down to nine seconds for exhausting um, all of our ports. Uh, and this is about 56,000 connections. And we're able to achieve about a 60,000 uh, connection, uh, or no, it's not 60, 6,000 connections per second with this approach. So let's take a look at how that works. So we start off with our system range of uh, 9024 to 65535. And then what we did was, is we created some arbitrary range. In this case, it's just zero to 1,000. We take that range, um, and then we uh, subtract it from the high range. So what we're trying to do here is, is we're trying to still leverage our full system window, um, but, we're, uh, but we're only using uh, 1,000 uh, port windows um, at a time. And then eventually, we go ahead and uh, set that socket option. And this will just place a window randomly within our port range but it's not it, it's just good for visualization but in reality we're actually shifting the whole window around constantly per connection we think overlap is okay uh reattempts may be necessary uh we will get into that uh in a little bit um but um in in practice uh this this actually works quite well and we can kind of see that um well i guess we'll we'll get there in a minute but um Using, uh, using this 1K window, uh, you know, we're able to achieve uh, very, very good performance. Um, and this completely leverages just randomly placing this window wherever we want. And of course, we assume overlapping is okay. Now, there is something interesting about this chart that we didn't really see before. We've now introduced black dots. Black dots are connection errors. And we can kind of see here that once we reach the very end of our port range, then we're starting to get our conflicts with our connections. And that's where reattempts may, uh, may be necessary. Or not, it just depends on your use case. In our case, we want to fail fast, very fast, so we can uh, move those connections along. So we did uh, some experimentation with uh, other windows. 
Um, in the 500 window case, we can see that we brought this down to about roughly 9.6 seconds. Um, the error rate between 500 and 1,000 window is uh, pretty comparable. Um, all the stats here are very comparable um, between these two. But when we actually look at the uh, 5K window or 10K window, our error rate just dramatically increases, our time dramatically increases as we exhaust our port range. And this is uh, due to the fact that the overlapping is now able to have more conflicts because our windows are so large, we're able to guarantee a port each time we, uh, we, uh, we loop through them basically. And well, now we get connection errors uh, once we fill that all up. But also time increases. So now we're not going, now we're not at 10 sec or nine seconds, we're at 13 seconds or 25 seconds. So this kind of, uh, you know, kind of defeats the purpose of what we're trying to look for. Still a lot better than three minutes, don't get me wrong, but uh, we, we, could do, we could do better with uh, smaller windows. So some takeaways, um, the current implementation um, always guarantees that a port is selected. Um, it's also not ex great at extreme uh, egress workloads, um, and we can reduce the, and then also with this uh, socket option, we can reduce the uh, port range to small loops. Um, a nice little side effect of this is now you can partition, uh, or you can, uh, you can partition IP addresses to your services. Uh, just give them a specific IP port range, and then, you know, there you go. Um, and then the, uh, with the random offset or a 500 to 100 window coupled with the random port picking, um, it, it works pretty well. Um, and the nice thing and the icing on the cake is purely user space uh, implementation. But before we really get to discussion and questions, we kind of want to open this up to um, a form of discussing policy within the, uh, within the kernel. Um, I've just explained um, a really, 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 really unique uh, case. Um, most cases don't need to um, exhaust the entire port range, but, some, but we need to account for that um, in, some of, in our cache service. But the question is, what about other people? So not all the time user space uh, is going to be able to provide the solution. So, um, you know, is there a way in which we can um, expand policy for picking ports? I know that the, uh, that the, uh, the specification calls for various algorithms that we can use to pick ports, but right now we're kind of bound to this. We're always selecting um, every other port looping, yada, yada, yada. So. Um, all right. Yeah, that's that's all I had to say. Thank you. Yeah, I wonder, not for TCP. I wonder you you have similar problem for the UDP. I know UDP has a connet. It's not a real connet, but they still allow connet. Have you looked at the efficiency of the connet in UDP? Right. No, we didn't really look at UDP um, right now at this moment. Or I know I, I meant to mention this uh, earlier that um, you know this this whole thing can go out the window with UDP, uh, for instance. But um, uh, but no, we we only focused on TCP. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be great if the same algorithm can also work on UDP. Right. Yeah. It should be similar. I think. Interesting. Well, um, try it out. Okay. So. Uh, you probably like discussed it. Uh, so this randomization offset, why it doesn't randomize odd, odd versus even? Uh, I'm sorry, why doesn't it randomize what? With this offset, with the random offset that it starts, why it doesn't randomize whether it starts odd or even? Uh, like it sounds like the algorithm always starts whatever even and then switches to odd. Yeah, but that's, uh, yeah, so the algorithm does uh, start that. There is randomization baked into it. Uh, again, I didn't uh, 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 give the slides for that, but when we look at the, um, when we look at the uh, offset calculation that by default is randomized, it's mainly there for a way to um, prevent fingerprinting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, this, this part I know, but like uh -huh. just did you try like agent randomizing the odd evenness? Like do randomly pick whether you go through odd first and then even. Yeah, I mean that's what we're then doing with whole... the random offset. Is we start at a random. We could potentially start at a at a random odd port. Do all the odds first, then the evens, or we can start an even. Do all the evens and oh, the odds. Oh, that's already there. Yeah, with the with the random offset of of the window. Oh, she means. Are you saying the fix that you're providing is extra patch, or this is existing how it works? This because is, if this it is, is, it kind of doesn't match the slides where you have like all the odd first and then even. Or I miss right. No, that, that that's exactly the point. Uh, maybe I didn't clarify this uh, earlier, but uh, yeah, with 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 the with the implement with the implementation as it as it stands, uh, if you have a low, uh, uh, the if you have your uh, IP uh, port window, um, if that starts the low end at an even number, 
It always loops through the evens first, then the odds. If it starts as an odd number, then it loops through all the odds, then the evens. Right. So in my question, just add this randomization, and then you won't have this bimodal stuff. Right. And that's what we're doing. Yeah, we're randomizing that. Oh, you... Right, no, that that's 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 the discussion I'd like to have. Like, what what can we do to, um, you know, to 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 allow the kernel to um, allow different uh, algorithms for poor picking? Um, what what can we do to add some uh, some functionality in there to to be able to achieve that? I don't have an answer for that, but. Um, yeah. um, you, you 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 mentioned earlier that you that there are also other heuristics. Um, just that they haven't been implemented. I mean, outside from the random uh, picking, did you also look into other things which like could be useful for workloads or? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we explored um, various um, architectural changes, um, but uh, with, with architectural changes comes with a lot of uh, bureaucracy, money, time, things like that. So, I mean, there's like, there's, there's, there's a few other things that we can try to, um, uh, architecturally speaking, um, or, or from the user space in this case, uh, like I said, this is a very uh, trimmed down uh, use case that that we've uh, that we've, uh, that we've uh, only really looked at. More questions? All right, thank you. All right, thanks.